y'all. Hope you're doing well today. So in today's message, I want to share some thoughts that um, started when I was watching The Never Ending Story with my daughter. And I haven't seen this movie in many, many years, um, but it was really interesting to get it from a totally different perspective, from a different level. Um, now that I'm an adult <laughs> and I've had a lot of life experiences, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it if you've seen it too. But um, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be mixing in all kind of elements from um, other things such as um, the video game I've mentioned um, recently that my daughter and I have been playing, uh, Mario World. Um, there's a lot of just... Um, I would even go so far as to say archetypal symbolism within these um, these creations, right? The the movie and um, the game, the video game, and whether um, these particular um, meanings that I drew from them were meant to be conveyed or not. If you look at the messages that you receive that are impactful and um, enlightening for you. When you look at those things through the lens of the collective unconscious, it kind of makes sense. You know, that even if the creator may not have meant to, to share a particular message through their artwork, through the symbolism, through the lines that were written for the characters or whatever it is, um, they still came through. They still came through somehow. And so my point here is what we've talked about a lot on my channel. Um, we all have different layers of our, of our psyche, right? Of our conscious awareness. And because of that, it comes through um, sometimes, in other words, the, the, the writers um, and, and all of those that are working on the development of these creations, right? That we consume. Um, they all also have an unconscious layer to their psyche. And so, it, again, I feel like that's what unites um, all of us. I feel like that's a, it's our best, our best, our best attempt at trying to define um, this numinous unity that we all seem to have, that we can tap into here and there, you know, intentionally or not, right? But, um, but it's beautiful and it's, um, it's oftentimes these things come through just when we need them. The timing is, 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 can serve as confirmation itself, right? Um, depending on what you have going on in your life. And, um, I just recently, I can't remember where I found this, but, um, I came across the term and I, I apologize. I don't have it, um right in front of me at this moment. I wasn't planning on sharing it, but there, apparently there's a, um, a label, right? Because everything nowadays has a, a diagnosis <laughs> or a label or something, right? Um, but this word essentially means um, when a person finds meaning in random things, right? So like what I would have called synchronicity in the past, right? And we know that synchronicity and coincidence are kind of like, you know, neighbors. And it's sort of like a fine line, right? But um, um, this term kind of, kind of pitched this same idea in a negative light. Like it was not healthy to find, you know, um, these, these relationships between seemingly random events. And I understand that on the extreme end, if it's, you know, impacting a person's life in a negative manner and they can't really even function and, or, you know, things like that, I get how that could be the case. But really, if you take anything to the extreme, it can be bad. You know what I mean? And so, um, if you think about even religion and what really more specifically spirituality, people who, um, have a faith in something greater, in a spiritual realm, in the divine, um, you know, it's not uncommon for people to feel like they receive promptings and guidance from the divine um, in their everyday life, in things that they come across or run into or see or hear. And so it's, it's again, there's a fine line and it's, you know, as a spiritual person, I feel like a lot of times, um, 
in our modern culture, there seems to be a battle between logic, you know, the material world, representing this physical material world, and spirituality. And it's sad, because I don't think it has to be that way. Um, and that's why I'm so, I have so much respect for what I would call trailblazers um, that have made a huge impact on humanity. Um, and I'm thinking of people like Ram Dass, um, who started out in an academic background and uh, was able to um, marry that with the spiritual and present that to the public for for healing and learning and growth and uh, just a great cause. And then you have Carl Jung, who um, went to the depths of um, of sanity um, and 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 danced on the line of insanity in his research as part of his efforts. And that's incredible. He was so passionate and he just gave so much of himself and his efforts to that endeavor that it, again, it feels like a joining of the logic, you know, literal, um, um, tangible, physical, material world. And there's this joining of that with the spiritual, right? So I feel like for a lot of us, we, we just don't really understand how you can deny completely that there's more, that there's more to existence, you know, than what meets the eye. So what we're gonna be talking about today is, um, you know, the part that the divine plays in helping us to reconstruct our life after a very trying and confusing and soul-crushing season. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about how we can release the past so that we can make space for the new. Um, and we're going to talk about the stages too. So, um, you know, we tolerated if you've been through very taxing, manipulative relationships, okay? I'm talking about wolves in sheep's clothing um, and or people who are just, they never work on themselves. Um, they, they don't see anything wrong with themselves. They can't, I think it's called, introspect, self-reflect um, and, 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 and adjust and grow from there to better themselves and you know their interactions with others. I'm talking about people like that, right? If you've spent a long time around people like that, um, and none of us are perfect, none of us are perfect, I'm not making that claim, but there's a difference in people who are able to introspect and want to learn and grow and people who don't, there's a difference. And so if you've come out of a, a really rough time in your life where you were affected dramatically and negatively um, from someone like that or multiple people like that. Your life has been thrown out of balance and as part of your healing, you know, you, you want to learn and understand what, what happened, right? And then um, you, you also are working through your emotions, which is really important as well. Um, you're trying to find this this new equilibrium because that was thrown totally out of balance, right? Totally out of whack um, when you were with this person. Although, because of the psychological manipulation, you weren't even aware of it, that it was happening. So it's kind of like you went through all this totally unaware until you started to wake up and then now you have to truly work at finding this equilibrium again. This is not some, this right here, to me is why you can't make someone understand who hasn't been through it themselves. You just can't. Now what you might be able to do is um, by, by sharing these kind of things with someone is make someone else also prompt them to start to wake up themselves to see how they have also been affected in their life because it's a weird thing. It's like you, you're in this state of slumber, right? This dreamlike state, dreamlike state, but it's more of like a nightmare, but, but it's not because you normalize everything 
On the outside of it, you see it as a nightmare, but when you're in it, you don't because you've normalized so much and you're in it. It's that whole, you can't see the forest for the trees thing, okay? So when sharing these things, you're either gonna find people who just, they're just, they haven't been through it, so they're not going to get it. They may say intellectually they grasp what you're saying, but they really don't. This has been my experience anyway, okay? Um, and because of that, they can, you know, try to be supportive or not, but they can try to be supportive and, and respond to you in, in a way that actually winds up invalidating you. And so be careful with that. I'll just caution you with sharing, you know, a lot of your story with just anybody and everybody because if you've been psychologically manipulated and abused, really, you've dealt with um, people intentionally making you doubt yourself, your own um, understandings and, and, you know, um, just all of the, the cognitive workings of your mind. So to add to that from someone who doesn't really get it, but they're trying to be supportive, if they're coming back in, in a way that's invalidating for you, um, it's not that you need the validation. You know what you know because you went through it, but to have invalidation put on top of everything you're trying to work through, you just, you don't need that. You don't need it. But another thing that might happen is you may think someone hasn't gone through what you've gone through. They may think also that they haven't gone through the kind of stuff you've been through. But as you're sharing your story, again, that might serve to be the prompting to wake that person up. And then therefore get them free, right? Which is a beautiful thing. Okay, so, um, but yeah, we, you know, ultimately we... What happened was we tolerated too much negative energy for too long because we didn't cognitively, consciously identify it, right? So, um, we're going to talk some today about the concept of relationship and how that's going to play a part in helping us to release the past so that we can make space, you know, energetically um, and literally for for our new life, okay? Um, so for many of us, our first discovery um, is that we wouldn't have been affected or as affected by a controller if we already had a strong relationship with God, with the divine, okay? Um, and we're going to be talking again, I mentioned the never-ending story um, in that movie. There's um, the main character, the warrior, uh, Atreyu, right? He's um, searching for what's called the Southern Oracle. And in order to get there, he has to pass through um, some gates. I believe there's three gates. And the first one is called the Sphinx Gate. And that is actually a test of strength, okay? And it's, it's if you think about it, they specifically say in the movie, you have to be so sure of yourself you have to have such a high level of confidence and assuredness in yourself um, to pass through the gate. Otherwise, they have like these laser beam eyes, you know, these statues that will, you know, shoot you and, and kill you, right? So, um, you can't have any doubt and, and make it through that gate. Um, so, you might think of this as um, a relationship dynamic that's required. A relationship with, with what? with yourself, right? Confidence in yourself. So relationship, the whole concept of it is powerful, okay? Because it implies, it implies distinction and separation and that in order for there to be strength and goodness and um, fruition, there has to be a uniting, a uniting that happens. So that would be the bringing together of two separate things or people or entities, okay? To create that powerful dynamic. Relationship is what makes that happen and drives it forward, okay? Um, but this, this has been a discovery for me and it's been a discovery for based on what I've heard a lot of other people is that even if we, we started out, you know, maybe for our whole lives, as long as we can remember, we've had, um, not just a belief in God, but we, we felt like we had a relationship with God, but going through this kind of stuff puts that in perspective because it's kind of like, it shows you, it's a reflection of how strong or how weak that connection 
or bond, right, with God, with the divine, really was. Um, and it's not our fault. I'm going to explain a little bit more about this, okay? It's not our fault if we discover, man, I, I don't feel like it was really as strong as I thought it was. In fact, it was extremely weak, you know? Um, it's, it's, I'm not saying this to, to blame me or shame me because this was a discovery in myself too, okay? So again, it's not our fault because oftentimes conditioning starts in our childhood, okay? Like um, specifically if a parent or even both parents are overbearing and manipulative, um, what they can do is they can place themselves in such a focal point in this child's life, in your life as a child, that that place is ultimately meant to be for God, okay? Who, through the Holy Spirit, um, and, you know, through the lens of the Bible, the Christian Bible, um, is supposed to reside within us and serve as our moral and, and, and our moral compass and our guidance, okay? Um, literally our inner GPS, okay? And so, that's how that works. And if we have, if we were raised by even just one parent that was very overbearing and manipulative um, and didn't allow us to access our own guidance, then essentially they're in that place that belongs to God. Um, and as children, it's like, a, we don't even know this, but B, we feel powerless anyway because there is a natural power dynamic where the, the parent has more power than the child, right? And so these, these parents who are manipulative and, and overbearing and controlling, they leverage that, that power dynamic, right? So um, I feel like when people grow up with feeling like they, they can't or they shouldn't, um, have a connection, you know, with their inner guiding light, or they, they, um, they feel like, um, to do so is to, to betray the parent, you know, or whatever it is. Um, I feel like that can push a child in one of two directions. Um, I go back to equating extremes with unhealthiness, right? Um, and that seems to just come back time and again as, um, true. I think that what can happen is this can drive a child to one end of the spectrum, which may be um, that they supposedly, this is what I've read, can turn out to be very narcissistic and controlling themselves, right? Because like as a facade, because truly they feel very disempowered because of how they grew up. The other way that, that this dynamic in a family can, can affect a child, it can drive them to the other end of the spectrum on the other extreme end, which is um, feeling just, just like they have to remain submissive as part of operating in this life, right? Um, and so um, it's just like a, a perpetual state of um, submissiveness. Not so much weakness, but when in a dynamic of relationship one of submissiveness but it's the what they call the locus of control is external not internal it's supposed to be internal right so that you're tapped into that numinous guidance okay so this kind of stuff is conditioning that that happens to people early okay and throughout life until we find the relationship that we never knew we needed or that we were being kept from right um we have selfish people, you know, even in our adulthood, till we, till we discover, we make this, this discovery until then, we have selfish people trying to fill that role um, for their own benefit. That's what happens. And so, um, you know, for myself and probably a lot of other people, maybe even you, um, as you're still engaged with a person like this and you're starting to wake up, you kind of enter into this this mode of, I think the term is reconnaissance. You're you're like in this recon type mode where you're you're awake, but maybe they don't know you're awake, and you're starting to see them for who they really are, right? 
Um, and that's good because it takes that. It takes, it's not about judgment. Again, it's about observation. It's about learning to be true to yourself. And it's about learning to trust, you know, the truth, the truth, right? And it's very emotionally taxing during that time, but it's validating. Um, I kind of view it like neutral observation, you know, in the moment, in the situation, but, um, but it is very emotionally taxing. So let's move forward. I just wanted to plant that seed about relationship and then we'll kind of tie it back in at the end. So the never ending story, right? In this movie, um, there's this, um, this big dilemma in this land called Fantasia. There's this nothing, they call it the nothing, right? This nothingness, which is like this, this void or emptiness that's brought about after this grand, just cata cataclysmic type storm that's rolling in. And then there's nothing left afterward, right? It's like a destruction, total destruction that's threatening the land of Fantasia in the movie, okay? And so, um, also I want to tie in, you know, Mario um, Wonder, the video game. Um, so there's Bowser and his dark kingdom, right? Taking over the flower kingdom, okay? So there's very similar themes in um, just these two small examples. There's tons of others. I'm sure you can find some if you look for them. But in um, the never ending story, Atreyu, who was called, who was summoned to be the warrior to battle against this nothing, right? Um, his assignment was ultimately to find a human boy, okay? Um, in order to give the Empress a new name. So much heavy symbolism. You can parallel that to a lot of other myths and fairy tales and folklore um, if you just go looking for it, right? But in the story, in the, in the movie, there, um, the main character is actually a boy named Bastion and he's reading this. He's reading the never-ending story in a book. Right, and then the movie is called also The Never Ending Story, but Bastion is the main character who's reading it. And within the book, the main character is, um, I would say, Atreyu, which is the warrior, right? And so both of these boys are, are very young, right? Which is significant and important and symbolic, right? So, um, but Atreyu in the, in the book had to find a human boy um, because that was the only person who could give the Empress of Fantasia a new name in order to save it from the nothing. She had to have a new name, right? Okay, so in the end, both Atreyu and Bastion become aware of one another in the movie. It's really cool. And they're both heroes, right? And so in the very end, Bastion becomes face-to-face -face with the Empress, um, almost like he he is in a tree's place and everything's restored. You know, it's really a, a real cool movie. I think it's cool. Um, it's a very similar theme to that book I shared with you all recently called Sophie's World, where um, there's a, a girl that's learning about philosophy, Sophie, and um, she's um, in contact, but it's like an elusive type contact with this other character named Hild. And so um, if you've read it again, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But there's like a, a blurring of the lines between those characters, too. Okay. So the book, um, The Neverending Story, I believe, is originally German. Okay. And again, uh, Bastian has to give the Empress a new name. And he does. And the name he gives her is, um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Mund Munden Mundenkind, which is German. And it means moon child. Moon child. So in the Bible, it wasn't uncommon for people transformed and made new through Christ to receive a new name also, right? So both um, the never-ending story and Mario wonder, and many myths and legends and fairy tales share the, the theme of rescuing a princess, right? Or an empress. So think about this. Jesus is described as a prince, right? A prince of peace. And if we are the bride of Christ, right? then we might say or consider the fact that, consider the fact, we might consider that maybe the princess character in all these stories is the personification of humanity before salvation, right? Before being given a new name, a new life, a rebirth, okay? 
um, deliverance from sin. I, I looked up salvation, and salvation means, um, <laughs> I like to just get the, the standard, um, it's deliverance from sin, right? And it's consequences, um, believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Christ. Okay. So, um, there's, a, again, a lot of heavy symbolism in the never-ending story. There's an ivory tower. And so, in the Bible, um, this stood for uh, purity, right? Purity, innocence. Um, so, I looked this up in the Cambridge Online Dictionary, which meant um, the ivory tower means not to know about or want to not to know about, right, to be naive, or to want to avoid the ordinary and unpleasant things that happen in people's lives. So, I can see the, the association through, through that lens, but um, I feel like in the movie it was representative of the first definition, which is to not know about, right, or bi biblically, biblically, excuse me, purity, right, naivety. So, to be sheltered, to be unaware, you might say to be in the dark, to be unconscious, to be um, asleep, right here. So the ivory tower is where, in, in the movie, the young empress lives, which is really represented awesomely, artistically. Um, there's like this, this large mountain that's floating in space, and it's like split. And then through the center, there's this um, glowing, you know, um, white beam, which is the tower. Okay, and again, I, I feel like the fact that it houses the Empress, it's uh, representing innocence and purity, right? It's more in alignment with the biblical uh, meaning there. So I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 through 5, which says, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, right? And then Luke uh, chapter 17, 20 through 21 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So there has to be, I feel like on this journey, the hero's journey, our journey, our soul's journey, right? The spiritual journey journey, there has to be a reclamation of childlike aspects, right? Essentially, a return to innocence. So, consider this. Historically, you know, I know I've felt this way. I wonder if you have. I've always been pretty shocked and appalled by some of the art that is depicting, you know, violence and, uh, um, things like sacrifice, you know, literally. Um, and but if you if you look at that symbolically, okay, then we can understand that our naive self, our innocent, unaware self, ha who makes a lot of mistakes too, right? But also is very at risk. Um, that has to be sacrificed for wisdom to come, for wisdom to come. It's like there's a, a dissolving of or a death of one's innocence as we are subjected to encounters with evil in this world. So we might say our innocence is sacrificed, right? Or our, our naive awareness for gaining wisdom for realizing that evil actually and really and truly exists. Um, one of the ways to say this is that the veil is torn, right? You're awake and there's no going back to sleep. So it's like, how can you have a return to innocence, right? Okay. But the instruction is to become childlike. So there, through the Christian lens, the sacri sacrifice of the only truly pure and innocent adult ever, which is Jesus, right? Um, Um, through that, through the Christian lens, it's like we are once again, we are once again innocent and saved from spiritual consequence, right? But what I want us to focus on in the message is to also remember the kingdom of heaven is within, and so we must become as little children. Okay, now, so consider this. 
the mindset of a child is what? It's wonder. It's hope. It's joy in the present. It's faith in its dreams. All of this comes naturally to a child, um, a child's mind and heart, right? But after we've been touched by the darkness, you might say, we struggle to get those things back. And it's not simple. Um, and thinking about the never-ending story, this nothing um, is spreading and threatening Fantasia, right? So in looking at the word Fantasia, we have fantasy. And fantasy means illusion, right? But what's interesting is... Um, Fantasy is from phantos, P-H-A-N-T-O-S, meaning visible. So, here it's kind of like that, that old movie, Waking Life, which is interesting if you've never seen it. It's kind of like, what is, what is real? What's not? You know, um, we, we're, you know, starting to talk about the difference between um, subjective and objective reality, right? Yeah, fantasy, illusion, yet... Phantos means visible, okay? So, we see a contrast between a void, the concept of a void, and what's visible, right? So, the Bible, you know, talks about having the eyes to see versus those who are like statues or idols, right? Because they have eyes, but they can't see. They're void of what? of sight. They're void of sight. So, the related word to phantos, uh, meaning visible, would be um, P-H-A-O-S or P-H-O-S meaning light. Light. So, light, spiritually speaking, we can put this through the spiritual lens, light is needed to make reality visible in the void spiritually. Also, um, phainine, fe, P-H-A-I-N-I, -I, I'm sorry, N-E-I-N, -E meaning to show or to bring to light. Consciousness, you know, I, I think of consciousness, conscious awareness. So, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it says, the earth was without form and void, right? Not just existing and empty, but literally without form, just void, right? And darkness was upon the face of the deep, right? And the Spirit of God moved, right? Upon the face of the waters. So, this is important. This is um, the first morsel <laughs> that we need to digest to grasp reality. What starts, what prompts all of this? The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God has to be moving, right? And in our life, the Spirit of God needs a vessel. There has to be an alignment. There has to be a clearing out of, making space and making room for this flow, for the Spirit of God to move within you. And pour out into your life. And if someone else has parked it right here. Trying to be in the driver's seat of your life. It's going to be in the way. They're going to be in the way. They're going to block that flow. See. For their own gain. So 1 John chapter 4 verse 16 says. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Have you ever noticed how powerful love is? It's very powerful. Think about all the songs written, all the lives changed, literally. So, if I had to define the true, the one true life force energy, I would define it as love. Right? Right? Not just God, but God in action as love, right? So when darkness wakes us up and steals our, in our innocence, we go through stages of getting acclimated, literally, right? It's like a whole new world after that forever. 
and I would say, you know, there's stages um, for many of us, and this is true for me. Um, you first have shock. And the thing about this is, the thing about these stages is they take their time and they get worked through and alchemized in their own time. It's not something you can rush. So shock, the first stage, um, I believe, can last months or even years. It's like when you're stuck in this trauma response, but really a part of you is processing, observing and processing, even if not consciously, okay? But on the outside, you might look like a zombie, you know, because you kind of are. That's the stuckness. That's the blockage of the life force energy, right? The next stage is awareness. You're, you're starting to have some of this stuff you're observing and experiencing trickle into your um, awake part of your psyche, your conscious part of your psyche from your unconscious, subconscious. It's starting to come through, trickle through, okay? And it's giving you awareness. So the second stage is awareness, a waking up, right? Um, a learning, emotional adjustment, all of this. Um, this is a very long stage and it's not like clear cut I think that these stages kind of you know waver and blend together and um, you know because healing is not linear right um, and then we have a stage of um, equilibrium right um, or one of acceptance and peace this is when you feel like you're there you've processed there's been many years of healing and learning and growing and you're there but I think that this is a mistake. I think that many of us do stop there and we think that's it. And we can even find happiness with it compared to what we've been through. But what we don't realize is that there's still something to reclaim. We think that we're changed forever. That's the old, this is the new, that's it. But there's still something that we haven't reclaimed okay this is my lens obviously but it's true that um like i said we've i've already said that <laughs> that we're forever changed and we are um the mistake comes in thinking and, uh, and or assuming that everything about our old selves must be put off right like the bible says putting off the old man but the thing is and it may have been a long time since you've had these things if ever Joy, hope, dreaming, curiosity, wonder, all, all that never belonged to us, and just take a minute to bring this in, all that never belonged to us as part of us, right? Remember, in order for there to be a uniting, a relationship, okay, it's like, it's sort of like the lens of, um, I forget what philosophy it is or what religion it is, to view yourself as a neutral observer, you know? And so concepts like joy are not synonymous with you. You know what I mean? Um, and because of that, you can reclaim them. It's not like, it's like making the mistake of, of thinking those things were a part of you back here in the past. You know, wonder, hope, faith, joy, all that stuff. Um, mentally, in our mind and heart too, if we assimilated those things um, within our own self and then we went through what we went through and we changed, we feel like those are gone because our entire old self is gone. We did put off the old man. So there, there's a, a, a very subtle distinction but it's critical in my opinion to understand that those things were not you. You've always been preserved. You've always been hidden. Like the Bible says, hidden in Christ. And so, those things were separate from you. And because they were separate from you, you can reclaim them again. Does that make sense? This was like a, just a subtlety that helped me. Okay? But now, just compare compare that, okay? Compare those things with, um, like logically, with the concept of naivety, right? Being naive. 
we can't get that back. We can't get our innocence back. We can't get our, our naiveness back, right? Um, so that's the difference. But we can get those things back. So if you haven't gotten those things back, it's an indication that you're not there yet. You know, your, your healing isn't totally done. Just done. You might be way far along and that's awesome. But I just, don't camp out there. Just, just consider this. I think as a collective, we like to think that we know how things are supposed to go. Like the timing of healing. And so we push our healing along, like making it, trying to make it conform to our expectations, right? We rush it. Um, and that may have been familiar and, and normal for us. We may have normalized that kind of a dynamic of pressure, just growing up in that kind of environment, right? But, but if we do that, to try and get done, you know, and check that off, check that box, it's like we're stopping short of true healing because we took a path of hurried expectations instead of submissive faith. Submission itself is not bad. Submission to other people is not good. That's bad. Submission to the higher powers is not bad, right? So letting nature take its course, letting nature take its course. I believe it can take a large portion of our lives to heal. I really do. Um, and in the meantime, we may have rushed ourselves even into making big life decisions because we, you know, we weren't truly healed yet. Um, so there can be consequence. Um, think about it. A decision from a place of healing versus a decision from a place of um, impatience and or unhealed pain or mental soundness. Those could be two totally different decisions, okay? So timing is everything, it really is. Um, patience is everything. And faith is required for patience. Okay. So your new name, your truly new self, your reborn self is capable, right? Not of naivety again, being naive again, but of wonder again of hope again, of joy again, of dreaming again. It's these things that are required to build beliefs, to build your new life in the spiritual realm first before we can see them, right? Before they materialize in the physical. So if all, if all you're asking for in prayer is to get through the day, that's what you're gonna get. Because you know, the Bible says, there's a verse that says, you have not because you ask not. Well, you're not going to ask if there's nothing to ask in your perspective. That relationship is required. So don't rush your healing and fool yourself. But also, just as important, maybe more, realize that love in action is the faith of a mustard seed. Right? We're told to ask and to believe that so that we will receive. So don't forget to reclaim your faith and therefore your wonder and your dreams. And as you see them, just slowly start to manifest. Your faith will increase. And you will start to feel the love of God ever more present in your life, okay? It's always been there. It's always been there. The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, in Christ, meaning in a state of submission, you might even say, in that state of relationship, of father-child dynamic. So it's always been there, but, but this will clear the path. We're talking about making space and clearing the path for the new to enter into your life, right? Not for you to just camp out and be done at a place of, of having a good grip on your emotions and just, you know, feeling secure and safe. That's good. That's good. But, but I believe we're meant for more. 
okay so um yes once we're able to clear that path here and here then we can feel the love of God once again and this will be the full restoration of your life force energy the flow right it's like um, you you blast the dam it's not dammed up anymore and you're you're it's flowing okay so you were never created to carry sorrow with you or guilt or shame and if it's more of an issue of being hurt by somebody else either way if it's in the past Whatever it is, if you're holding on to something in the past, even only within your mind and heart, an important question to ask yourself is why? Why are you holding on? God is described in the Bible as a jealous God, okay? And if you think about um, Job, you know, having everything taken away to test his faith, um... He, you know, he was steadfast, right? He's an example. God is supposed to come first. The first commandment, okay? Let's just reference the Ten Commandments here. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, God is supposed to fill that space in your heart and in your mind. And in doing so, that gives you that guidance, right? It's supposed to come from within, right? But not within where there's just a, a blank, empty space, but where it's filled with something. There is a relationship, right? Um, you know, the Bible says where two or more are gathered, there am I. And so if you think about that through the spiritual lens, it's kind of like, again, it's you're never expected to do it on your own. See? So, yeah, you shall have no other gods before me. So if we do put someone else in that spot because they just forced themselves there and we just tolerated it and let it happen for many, many years of our life, um, or, or, or if we're just void there, whatever it is, we're going to suffer. <laughs> we're going to suffer. We're not supposed to have anything else in that space before God okay so in enmeshed family so the, the dynamic is on the extreme end of the spectrum right so that's a good thing to study just um, to make a an example just for comprehension because in that kind of dynamic there's no borders or boundaries at all between everyone okay um, there's little if any privacy and there's an extreme focus on each other, this external locus of control. There's this dependency and codependency and obsession and, again, no boundaries or borders and no privacy. And, and this same kind of dynamic, like I said, it feels like it's more evident in like a, an enmeshed family environment. But it, it can also be within a relationship or a friendship or even a pastime, like an addiction, okay? So if we are idolizing other people or things and focusing on them to the extreme um, instead of God, then we are off the path of the childlike mind and heart. Okay. What do children do? Their minds and hearts are focused totally on their parents, right? Especially like infants. They're totally focused on their mother, right? That's the example of the childlike mind and heart. We too are supposed to have our minds and hearts fixed on our spiritual parent because literally everything else is unstable and we suffer when we forget this right so it's kind of like expecting apple juice from oranges if if it's not the way it should be then we shouldn't expect things to be you know good and peaceful and calm and fulfilling and fruitful and um, sustainable and you know so have you ever looked at one of those um this is this came to me and I was like yeah this is great I can't wait to share with y'all have you ever looked at one of those illusion drawings like where it's just a bunch of you know wild lines or you know patterns and stuff but there's this red dot somewhere in there and if you focus on that red dot intensely 
with your eyes, then this image appears, okay? But otherwise, if you don't focus on that red dot, it's like all the markings, you might say, are pure chaos, okay? God is that red dot. <laughs> And we are looking all over the page or the card, right? And losing track of each part that our eyes land on and getting upset about it. It's like the whole point is that that red dot makes the illusion appear. It's a creation from chaos or from the void. It's focusing on that one place that makes the order appear, the creation. It's the, it's the essentially the dynamic of creation, right? So our minds and hearts are like a beautiful garden. And God, as the red dot, is supposed to be the fountain in the middle. If we focus on the fountain, the garden is watered, and we have an oasis to explore and enjoy paradise. But if we're stuck crying over the weeds that grew and killed some of our favorite flowers because we were neglecting our garden, maybe we were focused on a different area, right? Then it'll just continue to either go downhill or it'll be simply a chore to manage. Okay, so our life is like that. Our life will be just that. We will live to manage, and we will manage to live, and that'll be it. The more attention we can start to give the fountain, right, which we won't even know, I'm sorry, which we won't, which we won't if we don't even believe the fountain exists, yeah, okay, so the more attention we can start to give the fountain, the more our garden will produce awesome results and spark renewed hope in our heart. So it's like we have to start somewhere, right? And it does take discipline, truly. You know, will, our, our willpower and our discipline, it has to shift, right? Um, we have to shift our focus and it takes that. How do we do this? How do we do this? Okay. It takes emotion to make things real. There's been um, writings on this. I wish I could remember what they are in the moment, but I've recently um, researched this, but apparently it takes emotion to solidify things, right? To make them stick. All right, so you can know something in your mind, but when you bring your feelings into it, it becomes real to you, okay? So the third factor here is bringing it to the outer reality, the creation process, the manifestation process. That's where love and God comes in. Okay, so in Mario Wonder, in that game, y'all, the main character, which you can pick, my daughter loves Princess Peach, but the main character has a prince that goes everywhere with them, right? Which is cool. And um, the one that she carries with her is called Prince Poplin. Okay, Poplin is a word related to the Pope. Pope, from Greek, papas, or Latin papa, originally meant father. So the third element, to bring it from here and here, is not just the father, but with the mind, the awareness of the father and his guidance. And secondly, emotion toward the father. There's a marriage of these three elements, the mind and the heart and the external that that we bring internal we we make it we make the connection through relationship okay when our emotion is brought into the equation and it's directed toward the father that creates the relationship and it's the relationship that ties it all together and brings order to our life from the chaos so Suffering is inevitable in this life, but consider this. Um, without everything I just talked about, without the Father, right? Suffering is experienced alone. You're just suffering. We all suffer. But there's a difference in experiencing it alone 
versus it's experiencing it with other good things in life. There's other good things going on. When you have that relationship because the life force energy is flowing through you and there are things present in your life, right? Um, and from those seeds of faith and wonder and hope and dreaming, right? So you get the full spectrum of this human experience with an emotional and intellectual relationship to the divine, right? I personally believe that this is the fountain, the relationship where we bring our mind and heart into it. The relationship is the fountain. It's also why those who are only religious often feel like they're just going through the motions because they are. It's one thing to intellectualize. It's another to feel it. And when you bring those together in the relationship, it's, it's like magic, okay? It's not magic like God's going to turn into a genie for you. <laughs> But again, it's like discovering the fountain or spring or source of your life force energy, right? So, um, so that you won't wither um, when you face your troubles. It gives you sustainability. And, um, and also, new flowers along the way. Your garden grows, okay? Your paradise grows. Um, so new things will bloom in your life with this guidance and relationship. So I hope this gave you some things to think about, some insight um, into how we can make the most of our life and not be held back from abundance and from a full life. So thank you so much for coming along to hear the message. I hope that it was um, helpful and got the wheels turning. And I just thank you so much for being here, walking the path with me. I hope that you have a beautiful day and I'll see you again very soon.